Hello everyone, welcome to Probability and Statistics for Data Science. Today we're going to discuss causal inference, which is the problem of estimating causal effects from data. We will describe how to frame causal inference within a probabilistic perspective and how this reveals why it is a really big challenge, especially if you don't have control over your data acquisition. We will also explain why randomized data acquisition allows us to perform causal inference. Let's get to it. We're going to be focused on a running example where we want to evaluate a new drug. We want to know whether the drug works. So there's a random variable T that indicates whether patients receive the drug or not. If they receive the drug, then T is equal to one. If not, T is equal to zero. And there's another random variable which tells us whether the patients recover. If y is equal to one, that means that the patient recovered. If y is equal to zero, it means that they didn't recover. So now we look at this observational study where we give some of the patients the medicine or the drug, uh, we, and, and we don't give some other patients the drug, and then we check. And what we observe is that the probability that a patient recovers if they did not um, receive the drug which is captured by this conditional PMF of recovery given treatment, evaluated at one and zero, uh, that probability is 0 0.38. The probability that they recover if they did receive the treatment, if they did get the drug, is 0 0.68. So there's a strong temptation for us to say, okay, this means that the drug actually works well, you know, because 68% of the people that took it recovered, while only 38% of the people that took it recovered. So this forces us to think a little bit more deeply about what these conditional probabilities actually mean. So what do these conditional probabilities mean? What they do mean is that indeed, 68% of the treated patients recovered and 38% of the untreated patients recovered. But does this really capture the causal question that we're trying to ask, which is, does this drug actually work? Not really, because there's a distinction between this and asking what would have happened to the patients that were not treated if they were indeed treated. So it turns out that these probabilities do not mean that if we had treated the patients that we didn't treat, 68% of them would have recovered uh, instead of just 38%. And this is really what we would like to know. What would happen to the same patient if we treated them or if we did not treat them? And in order to capture that, we need to define what is called the potential outcomes. Okay. Oh, I, I kind of, <laughs> you know, run to the next slide, but just to make it very clear, why is it true that uh, these probabilities do not mean that if we had uh, treated the untreated patients, then the probability would go high necessarily. Because it's possible that the group of untreated patients is very different from the group of treated patients. Imagine that the group of treated patients were young, healthy patients to start with that would recover anyways, whereas the untreated patients and our old patients that, you know, don't trust modern medicine that much and didn't want to take the medicine. So it's possible that that just accounts for the difference between the two groups, not that the drug actually works. Okay. And now let's go to describe the potential outcomes, which enable us to describe what we mean uh, by a causal effect in a formal probabilistic way. So as I said, we would actually like to know what would happen if we did not treat the patients that we actually treated. This is captured by the potential outcome associated to no treatment, which we um, denote by this random variable PO with a squiggly line on top with a zero here. This zero indicates that no treatment was given. If PO zero is equal to one, then the patient recovers. If PO zero is equal to zero, then they don't. This is defined for all patients, even the, one we the ones we treated. So it's hypothetical, but it is defined with within our probabilistic framework, and that's crucial. Similarly, we have another potential outcome, PO 
of one, which indicates what happens if a patient is treated, and this is also defined for patients that were not treated. Okay, um, if it's equal to one, then the patient recovered. In this hypothetical scenario where they were treated, if it was zero, they did not recover in the hypothetical scenario uh, where they were treated. Again, here you need to imagine this potential outcome as what happens to the whole population if we don't treat anyone. And of course, we know that we have treated some people. So uh, for those people, this is going to be what we call a counterfactual. It's hypothetical. But still, it's really useful in order to be able to define what we mean by a causal effect. Similarly, this other potential uh, potential outcome indicates what would happen if we gave the medicine to all of the population, even though we know that that was not the case. So what do we actually observe? We do observe the potential outcomes, but only for certain people. We observe the potential outcome associated to no treatment for the group of people that were not treated, for those we know if they recovered or not when they did not receive the, um, the, the drug. For the, the people that received the drug, we know if they recovered or not, if they received the drug. What is the challenge here? The challenge is that what we would really want to do is to see whether the probability that someone recovers if they're untreated is different from the probability that they recover if they were treated. But we don't observe this, right? We, we are not able to give the medicine to everyone in the population and also not give the medicine to everyone in the population. We just cannot do that. So we cannot observe these two potential outcomes simultaneously. To drive this very important point home, let's take a look at what the data actually look like. Okay, so here is our data. We're going to get samples, joint samples from these random variables. We're going to see, for example, that a certain patient, we did not give them the treatment. They unfortunately did not recover. And that actually tells us what would happen if they were not treated, right? Because they were not treated. So this is revealed. But we don't know what would have happened if they were treated. Okay, this is a counterfactual. We don't know what would have happened, but we still define it because it's important to us because that captures the causal effect. For this other patient, uh, they were not treated. The outcome in this case was positive. We, you know, we actually get to see the potential outcome associated to non-treatment, and it's positive. Now we look at a patient that was treated. They recovered. Now we do not see what happens to this patient if we don't treat them because we treated them. Okay, so that's a counterfactual now. Still, we define it because, again, it's important to define the causal effect. Uh, and we do see the potential outcome associated to treatment. Same thing for this other patient. We treated them, so we get to see the, the potential outcome associated to treatment. In this case, unfortunately, they didn't recover. Same thing for, for this other patient. They did recover. Again, these question marks indicate that we do not observe the value of that random variable for that particular patient. We tend to call this in causal inference counterfactuals because they're counter to reality. We did treat them, but we want to know what would have happened if we didn't treat them. Okay, so what do we actually really want? Well, what we get to observe is the probability that people recover if they were treated, right? This is, and we also see the probability that people recovered if they were not treated. This is what we actually see from data. Okay, the data tells us this. What we want to know to establish a causal effect is the probability that they recover in this hypothetical scenario where we don't give anyone the medicine or we give everyone the medicine. We want those probabilities instead. All right, so let's try to, well, let's express what we get from the data in terms of the potential outcomes, because as we saw, there is really a connection between them. There's actually a connection between them. When we, uh, when we, observe, when we have that the, the patient did not receive treatment, we do observe that potential outcome for that patient, okay? but conditioned on them not receiving treatment. We know that they did not receive treatment. Similarly, when the patient receives the treatment, we do see that potential outcome when, but only conditioned on that patient receiving treatment. So when is this going to be equal to this? 
where you remember our discussion about conditional PMFs and independence and so on, the equality actually holds if the potential outcomes are independent from the treatment. So the first time you hear this, this might be very confusing because you're like, wait a minute, you know, like if the treatment is effective, shouldn't it affect the outcomes? But you have to remember that these potential outcomes don't actually depend on the treatment because these potential outcomes indicates what happens if we don't treat anyone. And this potential outcome indicates what happens if we treat everyone. That doesn't depend on who we actually end up treating in this magical hypothetical world where we actually know what happens if we treat anyone and we don't treat anyone. Instead, if these guys are dependent, what happens is that we are treating a group of patients that is different in the sense that they have different potential outcomes to the ones that we're not treating. This goes back to my example where maybe we're treating young, healthy people and we're not treating old people. Okay, there's a systematic difference between the people that we're uh, treating and not treating, which is associated to their potential outcomes. All right, so hopefully that is clear. If they're independent though, then the population of treated patients is actually uh, very similar statistically with respect to the potential outcomes to the population of untreated patients. And that makes a lot of sense. That's exactly what we want. So that then the observed probabilities are actually um, a reasonable estimate of causal effects. So how can we achieve this? How can we make the treatment and the potential outcomes independent? Well, we can assign the treatment at random from the whole population. If that happens, we're not using the fact that this patient has certain characteristics that would make him or her recover more like, you know, like be more likely to recover or be less likely to recover because that's what the potential outcomes capture. We cannot take that into account, right? Because we're blindly just assigning them to treatment or no treatment independently from anything else. And in this way, we're going to achieve, we're going to um, be able to have two groups, the treatment group and the not treated group that have the same statistical properties because we're just kind of dividing the people at random. Here, when we say treatment at random and independently, we literally mean you take a patient, you flip a coin. Uh, if it's heads, you give them the treatment. If it's tails, you don't give them the treatment. And typically you don't tell them to avoid placebo effects. This guarantees independence between the treatment and the potential outcomes, and it means that we can perform causal inference by looking at these conditional probabilities. This is exactly what was done for the COVID-19 vaccines. Here I'm showing you the data for the Pfizer vaccine. They took a population of around 40,000 patients and divided them completely randomly between a treatment group that contained approximately 50% of the patients and a control group that had 50% of the patients. And what they saw is that among the patients that were treated, there were eight positive cases. Among the patients that were not treated, there were 162 positive cases. So this is a pretty significant difference. Uh, we haven't discussed uh, statistical significance yet, but there are so many patients that uh, this, this is actually a pretty big difference in that you can take my word for it for, it for now. Here, more than statistical significance, the real question is, were the two populations the same? That is the crucial question. And that is what is achieved by um, flipping this coin to decide whether the patient gets the vaccine or not. And that's what guarantees that these conditional probabilities actually reflect a causal effect of the vaccine. I can't overstate how important randomization is to be able to establish causal effects. It's really the, 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 the ultimate test for causal effects. All right, so what have we learned? We have learned that um, we have learned the definition of potential outcomes that allow us to describe the problem of causal inference uh, probabilistically and define it also rigorously so that we know actually what we mean when we say causal, um, a causal effect, which means that, um, I mean, a causal effect is basically that the two potential outcomes are different. These potential outcomes are these hypothetical random variables that uh, capture what would have happened if we had treated all the population or not treated all the population. We saw why randomization allows us to perform causal inference. And conversely, we saw that why without randomization, if there's no guaranteed independence between the treatment and the potential outcomes, then it's actually very difficult to perform causal inference. We will 
go deeper into that topic in the next video. And that's all I got. Thank you very much.